The moment of heartbreak has arrived. I need to sell some of my beloved rare video games so that I can afford more. See, I'm currently in a bidding war for a vintage Tetris cartridge and my new nemesis, Lasagna Lover 22, is already hiking up the price on eBay. But before I part with my beautiful collectible babies, I want to see what really helps a listing sell because the more money I bring in, the more I can bid in my war against my nemesis. Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz and this is Study Hall, real world statistics. Differences help us make decisions and prioritize. It's all a matter of showing whether a change can sway someone, like, for example, adding a picture to an eBay listing versus just putting up the listing without one. And lucky for me, comparing two things that aren't related is an area where statistics shines. Back to my bidding war. I want to see if having a picture of the game included with the ad is related to a significant increase in the final selling price. To include a photo or not include a photo? That is the question. Taking pictures takes time, but the alternative is even worse, not making enough money and dying without ever knowing the feeling of owning a beautiful, mint condition, unopened 1989 Tetris NES cartridge. Moving quickly means my sample sizes won't be huge, but I can still collect data and use stats to solve this problem. And as I speak, Lasagna Lover 22 keeps jacking up the price. So I'll quickly take a random sample of 36 video games that have a picture on the ad and a random sample of 36 that do not have a picture on the ad. Then I'll keep track of the final selling prices of all the games in my two samples. Afterwards, I can compare the average selling price in both groups. And looky here, the photo group does tend to have higher bids on average, but I'm not sure if that difference is considered a lot. How spread out the data are within each group is also something to think about. So I now have to see if the mean selling price in the photo group is significantly larger than in the non-photo group. This leads me to hypothesis testing, which is the statistical process that helps us determine whether we have enough evidence to support an argument. But deciding what kind of hypothesis test to use will be key to figuring out whether I'm going to become Ansel Adams in the next hour or so. I'll need to identify some key features of both the data and our question first. So we have data from two groups, one with photos and one without, and those groups contain totally different games so they seem independent, as in we don't expect the price of a video game in one group to be affecting the price in the other group. Now we want to compare the means of each group to find out if they're pretty much the same. We're also in a scenario where we don't actually know the true population standard deviation of each group's prices, so we can't use any methods that rely on those numbers. But it's okay, all of the properties we do have lead us to the two independent samples t-test, a type of hypothesis test that helps us when we want to know whether the unknown population means of two groups are equal or not. It's super useful in all kinds of situations, like determining if different geographic groups have equal access to healthcare resources, or whether morning exercisers go to the gym more times per week than the afternoon variety, or for me, a person who needs cold, hard cash. Now for a two independent samples t-test, we'll want some key elements that might sound familiar. We'll need null and alternative hypotheses, a test statistic, assumptions to check, and a probability distribution to calculate a p-value that will ultimately help us make a decision. First, we need to turn our informal question into a formal statistical one, with hypotheses and everything. The null hypothesis, as usual, represents nothing to see here, folks, which in this case means that the two groups have the same population means. Basically, for our purposes, if we look at the difference in means, there would be no significant difference between the mean price of video games with and without a photo in the ad. I could just immediately post my game, no image needed, and boom, let the bids come in, which would be ideal, seeing as Lasagna Lover 22 just ramped up the bidding prices again. The alternative hypothesis, though, represents what we are interested in discovering, which here is whether the mean price of ads with the photo is greater than the mean price of ads without a photo. We wind up with a one-tailed or one-sided test since we care about which group has a bigger average price, and in this case, the difference in means would be positive. Now, before we launch into calculating anything, we need to make sure our assumptions are met for this two independent samples t-test. Basically, we assume care characteristics about the data going into our test, and if those assumptions aren't met, we trust our results less. The main thing is this shows our methods work and that we can trust them. To start our little gut check, we first need to make sure that the sample we take from the population is random, so that we represent the broader population. Next, we need the populations of the two groups to be drawn from approximately normal distributions. Since we have more than 30 data points per group in this case, the central limit theorem applies, so we are looking at… Ta-da! The normal sampling distribution. It's my favorite shape. 
That lets us skip a step. If we have fewer data points, we could plot the data we had and see if they were approximately normal, which would help us get a feel for the whole distributions of these two populations, and the sampling distribution of the difference in means. If we think the two populations have equal variation, there are also other ways to simplify our calculations, like using a pooled t-test, but we don't know enough about this video game situation to go there. Next, we move on to test statistics, which help us measure how far sample results are from expected results. And while we're doing this, Lasagna Lover 22 just outbid me again. This is dire, people. Now, we've observed a sample mean for each group, $49.10 for the 36 games with a photo in the ad, and $44.30 for the 36 games without a photo in the ad, for a difference of $4.80. From that number, we subtract the true difference in means, assuming the null hypothesis is true, and our null hypothesis is that there is no difference, so we'd just be subtracting zero. So that $4.80 is just the numerator of our test statistic. On to the denominator which requires us to look at the variability of the sampling distribution of our difference in means. Now we know that every time we take a sample, the mean is different because the observations in our sample change. But how different are all of these means really? Well, the mean sampling distribution tells us how much sample means wiggle around just due to the sampling process alone. It's centered on the true population mean, as if we could observe every used video game up for sale online. So we expect a sample mean close to the truth on average. How close depends. The variability of the sampling distribution is represented by a standard deviation, and that standard deviation is equal to the true population standard deviation scaled by the square root of the sample size making up that sample mean. So the variability goes down as the sample size increases, but not in a one-for-one -one kind of way. In the case we care about now, which is the difference in means, the sampling distribution is similar. It's centered on the true difference in means and has a standard deviation equal to the true population population standard deviation of the difference in means scaled by the sample sizes. So the separate variation in selling prices for video games with a photo and without a photo get combined together to represent the variability of the differences between the two groups. Basically, if one group has way more variation in price than the other, the differences are going to be wildly varying too. Now again, we don't know the true population standard deviations that make up that denominator, but we can estimate them by using the sample standard deviation of each each group. Putting that all together gives us a test statistic of 2.47, which is a standardized way of measuring how far our sample is from our expected result. Remember that the goal of the test statistic is to standardize what we see, and also help us compare it to what we would expect to see if the null hypothesis was true. We want to know how unlikely it was to see that $4.80 difference if we were living in a world where there was truly no added benefit to including a picture on the ad. And we'll need a probability distribution to translate that 2.47 0.47 number into a probability so that I can make bank and finally claim this Tetris game. We've used the normal distribution for hypothesis testing before, but that required us to know the population standard deviation. Here we have to estimate it, which means that we are a little bit more uncertain about everything. We need a distribution that is similar to the normal distribution, but reflects that added uncertainty. That is what the t-distribution is for. The t-distribution looks like the normal distribution in that it is symmetric and bell-shaped, but it has has slightly heavier tails. That means that the left and right hand sides of the distribution have more area in them. That will be relevant when we start to calculate areas under the curve. Another difference between the t-distribution and the normal distribution is that it has an extra parameter called the degrees of freedom, which we've discussed in other episodes. This number is related to the sample sizes of our data, the sum of two sample sizes minus two. The larger the sample size, the larger the degrees of freedom, and the more normal the t-distribution looks. We're getting into some math here, but I promise it's helpful to know what buttons you're clicking when you eventually just let the spreadsheets do this for you. For us, this t-distribution has 36 plus 36 minus 2, which equals 70 degrees of freedom. To find that area under the curve, we'll use a table. But this one works a little differently than the table for the normal distribution. Instead of using the test statistic to find the p-value, we find the row for our degrees of freedom and look for or the test statistic that corresponds with a chosen significance level. We call that test statistic the critical value. That's because it's the tipping point between rejecting or failing to reject the null at the significance level we chose, which is 0 0.05, a pretty common option. So if we're going to use an alpha of 0.05 as our cutoff for rejecting the null hypothesis, we go to the column that represents that alpha value. The intersection between the degrees of freedom row and the alpha level column is the critical value that leads to a p-value of 0. 
0.05. There's no specific row for 70 degrees of freedom in our table, so we typically go down to the next closest one. Here, it's 60. The intersection now says 1.671. This is where an image becomes useful. If the area to the right of 1.671 is 0.05, then the area to the right of our test statistic, 2.47, is even smaller than 0.05. That means that we do have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Basically, I better go get my camera and start taking some sweet shots if I want those babies to sell. Now, everything we just did was pretty time consuming, which isn't ideal when I'm fighting for my life against Lasagna Lover 22. I will die if I don't get this game. But like I said before, the good news is that we can use software to help us do all of this automatically. We still have to define our hypotheses and check our assumptions, but then we can let the computer do the rest, which is ideal for me personally. Take Google Sheets, for example. If we have each sample in a column of our spreadsheet, we can use our software's t-test function to calculate the test statistic and p-value for us. We will need to specify that we are interested in a one-sided test, the two samples are independent, and we are not assuming that the two samples have equal variance. And that little bit of lifting aside, we can sit back and watch technology perform magic in front of our eyes. Although it still means I now have to channel my inner Annie Leibovitz. In the end, lots of questions about our world involve looking for significant differences between groups. Maybe someone is trying to prove that they've been unfairly treated in the workplace, or maybe you're investing stock and comparing portfolio options. Those decisions all require detecting a difference between groups. And no matter the scenario, stats can help us find those differences and make decisions. Like whatever I need to do to finally outbid Lasagna Lover 22. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, smash that subscribe button, and comment your favorite video game. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.